Praise the Lord. Lord. In the book of Romans, chapter number 12 and verse number 8. And we're at the latter part of the verse. He that he that ruleth with diligence. If you're going to rule, you need to do it with diligence. Now, there's a few things in this that we we need to consider. The first is the ruling that he's talking about is in his house. That then lies first with the pastor. First Timothy chapter number three. You cannot be wishy-washy. You cannot be easily persuaded back and forth with every, as the scripture says, wind of doctrine. You can't be like that and be a pastor. And in First Timothy chapter 3, he starts off with giving the qualifications of a bishop. Bishop is not an organizational bishop here. This is talking about the, the role of a bishop, which is just another title for pastor. There's 17 or 18 titles. I think I got maybe 19 titles for a pastor in the Bible. And one of them is bishop. You can't be over God's house just because you want to be. So he didn't leave it up to chance. He gives qualifications that you have to meet before you can even consider being in the position. Now, I know some people get angry when they hear a young minister say, I want to be a pastor one day. But, But the Bible says... He that desires the office of a bishop, does he say called? He that desires the office of a bishop. Well, let's just, verse 1. This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. So it doesn't say that wanting to be a pastor is something that you have to be called to. But he's being very clear up front. It's a good thing if you want it, but it's work. It's good work, but it's still work. Now, I remember hearing, um, well, I'm not going to say his name. He's, he doesn't have a whole, he's a, he's a TV evangelist. They were asking him about having um, a 24-hour chauffeur service that drove him around. He had a driver that drove him wherever he wanted to go. They talked about the amount of money that he had invested in his home, the millions of dollars in that, just, just this extravagant lifestyle. And they were talking to him about it, about the fact that what does that say to young people who, who are struggling to make it? You got young couples in your church that are struggling. They're giving all their money to you and you living in the lap of luxury, but they're struggling. He said, well, I don't feel guilt about this at all. I want the young drug dealers to know that you can make money serving God. That's exactly what I said. What? You turning Church into a money-making scheme? It's work. You don't become a pastor to get everybody to work for you. When you become a pastor, you work for everybody. So when he says that uh, it's a good work, it means you have to desire to be a worker for God. It, he, he said, if a man desire the, offer, the office of a bishop, he desireth, E-T-H. It is not a, you know what, I would do whatever work God wants me to do. Oh, no, 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 no. 
It's not work to get there. It's work when you're there. And it's continuous work. You have to fit. When you're a pastor, you fit your life around God's work. Not the other way around. Verse number two. A bishop then must be blameless. Now, there are some things that disqualify you from being a pastor. It is not because God doesn't desire you to work for him. But there are some things that are so bad that people will never get over it. You become blamable. And you can't go any further in God. There are just some things you just can't do. One of our pastors, one of our bishops, he was pastoring, preaching. He, would, he was really preaching the house down week after week after week. Folks were getting the Holy Ghost. But he had, he had a girlfriend. And he was paying for her apartment so he could go see her whenever he wanted to. When, he, when she found out what he was doing, what he did for a living. She said, I'm going to go to the church and see just what he does. So she showed up, got convicted from the message that the, the no good preacher was preaching, got convicted, came up, and got the Holy Ghost. But now let me show you what the Bible says, your sins will find you out. When she got the Holy Ghost, she said, this thing is real. And what you've been doing with me has been wrong. If you don't tell it, I sure am. So he got himself together. But is that repentance? It's not repentance when you're sorry after you get caught. That's not repentance. That's blamable. It's one thing. And please understand, I'm not trying to make it be all right for a pastor to fornicate. I'm not saying that at all. I want you to see there's a difference in mindset. It's one thing to fall into sin. It's another thing when you paying for your girlfriend's apartment so you can tiptoe over there whenever you feel like it. That's a whole different mindset altogether. That's blamable. There are some things that you can do that you can't repair. And so a pastor has to be blameless. You can't have, can't have your name out in the street that you're still flirting with women and you married and you're a pastor. You can't have that. You can't have a name of certain things. Let me take it a step further. Some of them getting caught with other men. They, they, they've had them. They've had them. Um, well, amen. I'm about to say somebody's name. and I, I got to be careful. And not because it's wrong. I just don't want other ministers getting up and doing the same thing. Think, well, the pastor did it. <laughs> getting caught with other men. You can't fix that. You blamable now. As a matter of fact, in the Old Testament, and we're not going to go there, but in the Old Testament, he gives a list of things that disqualifies you from the priesthood. Because there are some things you just can't overcome. We had a pastor not far from here who had been arrested, tried, and convicted of pedophilia. But he's pastoring. That's blamable. You can't overcome that. So if you want to be a pastor, that's fine. But you got to make sure your life stays clean. Yes, sir. He said, isn't that premeditated? Um, when you're talking about setting up a... Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. There are some things. There are some things that people fall and do. It's not premeditated. Somebody says something really nasty to you and... Uh, for you know it, you don't said a cuss word at them, or you don't hit them. You know that, that you're caught up in the passion of the moment. That's 
it's not excusable, but it's understandable. But you paying rent for your girlfriend, that, that's premeditated. You going over to her house to pray for her in the middle of the night, that's premeditated. What you think is going to happen? God, listen, we have good sense when it comes to our money, but bad sense when it comes to our soul. You think that's going to work with God? I ain't loaning them no money. They look shady. But then one of the sisters in the church calls you up and says, uh, I'm just not feeling good. Can you come over and pray for me? And it's two o'clock in the morning. Where's your good sense then? We, if you want to be a pastor, you can't wait until you become a pastor to become blameless. You have to live your life so that you cannot be blamed about things. I've heard people say things like, yeah, he's a pastor now and he's crooked as the day is long. You can't have a reputation like that. And then say, yeah, but I'm a pastor. Or I want to be a pastor. I've straightened up now. Some stuff you drag with you everywhere. Is it fair? Is it? Is it fair? Yes. Let me, let, me, let me give you an example. In this country, when you go to jail and you have served all your time, we say, you have paid your debt to society, right? Then why do they ask you on an application? Have you ever been arrested for or convicted of a felony? Why do they ask that if you've already paid your debt to society? Because there are some things that will follow you the rest of your life. You don't want a pastor that has to go sign up for the sex offender registry. I don't care how good of a preacher he is. I don't care how good of a counselor he is. It doesn't matter. There are some things that you can be so blamable in that you can never overcome that hurdle. It may seem like it's not fair because you've got yourself together. But God has a reason why he does stuff like this. He must be the husband of one wife. That is not I know some people say that this means that a pastor can only be married one time in his life. That's not what this is saying. This is a ban on polygamy, which was very prevalent, especially in the first century. Not only more than one wife, but concubines to go along with it. He's putting an end to all of that. The husband of one wife. And we had a case where that happened here we had a pastor that came from Africa who wanted to be elevated to the office of a, of a bishop. And guess who he brought with him? Both of his wives. And they had to take him off to the side and tell him, oh, ho, oh, hold on, brother. You can't have that. Now, this is modern times. You can't do that. You can only have one. Pick one and get rid of the other one. They didn't elevate him. He come back the next year, and he had gotten rid of one of his wives and was living with only one woman. Amen. They elevated him up. There are some things that God requires from a pastor. Now, if you don't ever want to be a bishop, well, then you can have multiple wives. No. We got another scripture that says, let a man have his own wife not wives wife one so he hems it in there's no well that's just for bishops nope he desire uh, uh, the husband of one wife vigilant you, you, you have to be aware of what's going on and, and dedicated to that not just just aware, but you have to be aware of what's happening with God's people. If you want to be a pastor, you have to be aware of what's going on. And let me just say this. There are times when I don't see something because it's not time for me to see it. Then there's times when I see something and I don't say anything 
because God hasn't given me permission to say it. So I have to keep my mouth shut. You have to be vigilant, though. You have to be aware and ready to act when God tells you to. Sober. That's not talking about drinking alcohol. That's talking about when you're dealing with God's people. You don't want somebody, um, a family member dies, you go to the pastor, and he's cracking jokes while you're in there. I'm just trying to cheer you up. No. A pastor has to be sober. He has to be, he has to be conscious of what's going on. When you're drunk, when a person is drunk, it's not like they're totally unconscious, but they're desensitized to things that's going on around them. It, there, there have been times when I've heard people say that they got drunk and when they woke up the next day they had bruises on them and didn't know whether they had been in a fight, whether they fell, a car accident, didn't know, just was hurting, aching because of stuff. They didn't know because they were so drunk. Right. They weren't so drunk that they couldn't drink more. They weren't so drunk that they couldn't speak. They just didn't remember, had blackouts and stuff. Well. A pastor can't get like that to where he's so wrapped up into whatever that he's got no time for God's people. He must be of good behavior. You know what that rules out? Y'all better be careful. You better, you better watch what you're saying because I'm about to set my Holy Ghost to the side. Don't make me lose my religion for a minute. That, you can't. You cannot be a pastor and have that kind of temperament. Amen. Spouting off at the mouth, got a bad rep, behave yourself nice when things are good, behave yourself bad when things ain't going your way. You can't be like that. You have to be of good behavior all the time. Apt or given to hospitality. You can't be a pastor and not hospitable to God's people. Wait, let's take it a step further. Don't come to my house. I don't, I don't have the saints come to my house. That's my, that's my castle. That's my private. You got to be given to hospitality. Don't give nobody my phone number. That's not hospitality. That's selfishness. That's hireling material. Apt to teach. The word apt means able. How can you, when teaching is the most important thing for a saint, that's how we live. Amen. How can you lead God's people and you can't even feed them? You might preach the walls down, but if you can't feed the people, how long will they be able to live on snacks? Right. Not given to wine. No striker. What striker? That means you can't hit your wife. Don't strike her. <laughs> Pastor shouldn't be violent. Shouldn't be out brawling and fighting with people. I ain't forgot, I ain't been out the streets so long that I ain't forgot how to. Let's move on. Not greedy, a filthy lucre. You know what filthy lucre is? Getting money the wrong way. You got a good job, ain't nothing wrong with that. If the saints want to just give you something, <clears throat> that's not filthy lucre. That's just lucre. Shouldn't be, hallelujah, I'm going to let that go. Greedy, a filthy lucre, but patient. A pastor has to be patient. He has to be willing to hear the same thing over and over and over and not say, I'm sick of you coming to me with this. That's important. Because... How would you feel now? How would you feel if you were sick and you were suffering from um, 
a back ailment. And just, you can't see it. It's not like a broken bone or anything. But you're in pain a lot. So you go to the doctor. And you go frequently. And the doctor says, I'm getting kind of tired of this. Are you for real or are you for fake? I mean, you up in here twice a month. What is, go would you keep going to that doctor? Absolutely not, because his job isn't psychiatry. It's not to diagnose whether you're faking or not. That's not it. He's taking care of what you're saying. Now, there's a little tweak in here and there, because they will make you go to pain management if you keep on asking for some heavy drugs. They'll do that. But it's not because the doctor doesn't believe you necessarily, but because there's so many people that have abused the system that they've had to change it. It used to be you could go to the ER, and if you were in pain, they did whatever they could to mitigate that pain. But then they had groups of folks that they call frequent flyers that are constantly coming in, oh, I'm in pain, I need a shot. Like, oh, no, no, no. You're not getting another shot till you go see a pain management doctor. If it's serious, then that's what you need to do. Go see a doctor that deals specifically with pain management. Because we're not going to keep on doping you up. That's not because the doctor doesn't believe you, but the state has had to get involved. You know why? Because doctors at one point were so eager to help people get out of pain that they were giving them what prescriptions they thought they needed. And they were turning people into drug addicts. So it had to be dealt with. It's not that the doctor was interesting, interested in being a dope dealer. That's not it at all. He's just trying to do his job. But because of things that happen in California, it affects things that happen in Michigan too. So it's not just a matter of, well, they know that I'm not like that. It's not like that. There has been so much abuse in so many different places that the federal government has had to come in and institute regulations to prevent that. So, having said that, doctors don't get angry with you because you keep coming in. They deal with it. A pastor should not get angry with you because you keep coming in. Their job is to help you get past it. I knew a one brother that was doing something wrong. They, the pastor silenced him. He got caught doing wrong again. Pastor silenced him. Got caught doing wrong again. Pastor said, are you going to stop this? He said, no. You can't help somebody like that. You can't help a person that's telling you, I'm not going to stop sinning. But there's no point in praying for them. But let me just tell you this, even though a pastor must be patient and God is long suffering, don't let it run out on you. Amen. Don't let God's mercy run out because it can and it has on many an individual. Not a brawler. So you ain't going around fighting with folks. Nor cov or not covetous. You're not out looking. Brother, where you get that Cadillac from? Huh. Now, if you love me, that's covetousness. But here's what we're getting to. Verse number four. One that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. Now, if a man, or for if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Now, when he says rule your own house, is he talking about being a dictator in your home? What he said, rule. I'm going to tell you something that shouldn't be said, and it's true. Well, daddy said no, but that's all right. Just wait till mama gets home. She'll say yes. That's not ruling your home. When he talks about ruling your home, he's talking about governance and Amen. diligence. Amen. If your house is so out of control 
that the kids is running it, that the wife trumps what you have to say, then you don't need to be a pastor. One of my kids did that to me one time. Hope y'all caught that. It wasn't her. <laughs> yeah. It came and asked me for something. And I said, uh, well, okay. And then they turned around and was, was, I think she was just kind of walking away and said, good, because mama said no. And it was like, ho! Oh! Whoa, 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 come back here. So after, after I gave her a whipping, then we discussed why that should never happen again. Your children, uh, let me say it this way. Parents should have good communication, right? And a child should never be able to pull a fast one on a parent. Now let me tell you a rule that I had. If your mother says no, don't come ask me. If I find out that you ask me, and your mother and I talk, if I find out that you asked me after she, you asked her, I'm beating you. Oh, yeah, I'm going to tear you up. Statue of limitations done run out on my weapons. My youngest is over 30. I tear him up. Don't let me ever find out. So... Here's what they did, because children, they, they, they can be little attorneys, too. Can we, can we go to McDonald's? No. Is it all right if I go ask Mama and see what she says? Because they knew. And almost every time it was, no. I don't care what your mother says, you ain't going to McDonald's. That ended it. Now, how can you be a pastor? And someone comes in and says, well, I want to sing this week. And you say, no. But then the, the devotion leader says, well, they sing good, so I'm calling them up anyway. Some folks do that. Pastor so-and-so is here. They want to know if they can have some words. Well, no, not really. Then two or three people come up. Well, that's my cousin. I feel like they should be able to say something. Now, well, oh, well, all right, go ahead, let them get up. You can't be a pastor and moved like that. But there has to be a balance, too, because you can't be so stubborn and hard-headed that you don't listen to nothing people say. It can't be like that either. How do you learn, then, the balance between when it's time to say yes, when it's time to say no, when it's time to say, well, maybe we'll give it a try. I, I hear what you're saying, we'll give it a try. How do you learn that? By being married? <laughs> By having children? I don't care what anybody says. Raising children is more than a notion. They make it look all nice in the movies, and the kids in movies are all smart. <laughs> That's a lie. <laughs> Kids in the movies patch up relationships that mom and dad are having bumps in the road, but the kids are able to talk to them and help them through it. Please. <laughs> Grown-ups struggle. That's the reason why we got psychiatrists. But if you look at the movies, a 10-year-old is a good psychiatrist. That's a bunch of craziness. And it's damaging the children. Because if they see their favorite TV star always helping out mom and dad whenever they have trouble, but I can't do the same thing, what do you, how do you think that makes a kid feel? Right. Something's wrong with me. Yeah. Raising children teaches you the balance. There's been times when I've said no, and they pled their case, and it was like, well, all right. And then there was times when they pled their case and I saw where it was going and was like, say another word. You don't learn that balance by God just throwing it on you. 
You learn it through trial and error. And I'm going to tell you one of the things that I learned my father used to say that I hated. I said, I will never say this when I have children. Nope. Would you say? No, she said, because I said so. Nope. I never said I wasn't going to say that. <laughs> I, I knew I was going to use that one. The one I hated was, we ain't going to get that started. And it was like, Why? It's just me and you. Why can't we go get a root beer? No, nope, we ain't going to get that started. We ain't starting nothing. <laughs> why, why not? But you know what? I learned why. I take one of them with me. We go to McDonald's and get an ice cream cone. Don't you say nothing. We get home 20 minutes later. I want ice cream. Who said anything about ice cream? You know what? I got it started, didn't I? Now it's, well, that's not fair. You always get them. So you know what I had to learn? Oh, no, we ain't getting that started. My children taught me that. Saints will teach you that. Saints will teach you, we ain't getting that started. Oh, they've, they're, listen, since I've been pastoring here, there have been things that some folks have come up and said, we, can we start doing this? I was like, nope, we ain't starting that. You know why? Because I could see further down the road. If, if, if I start that now, it's not going to stop. And guess who's going to deal with it? Me. We ain't going to get it started. That's, that is what ruling is. It's not a matter of because I said so. You ain't doing it because I said so. I don't think I've ever told anybody here that because I said so. Right. Nobody's pushed me to that point. But I'm not saying it won't happen. <laughs> I'm not saying that. <laughs> I've just never been pushed to that point yet. I try to be pretty patient. I've, I've talked with one of the saints before and they was very upset with me. And said, why are you so angry with me? I said, I'm not angry with you. Well, why are you raising your voice at me? I said, because you keep trying to over talk me. I'm not angry with you. But God is. Maybe you hearing God's anger. Because you keep on trying to shut me down and cut me off and tell me and get me straight. I said, you know what? You're going to keep on. God's going to get you. Wow. you, you, you you're treading down the Amen. wrong road. And he got them. Amen. He got them. They died in their sins. What time? Okay, okay, we got a little. We, just, we got a little time. Just a little bit. Amen. Another thing that a pastor has to be that's in this word ruling is diligence. You can't be faithful when you know it's Mother's Day, but the next Sunday, Amen. you might be out at the beach. You have to be oh. diligent. You can't be diligent when everything is going well, but when it's just you and a handful of folks, you're not diligent. You, you can't be like that. God, your diligence starts before you become a pastor. And if you can't be faithful on your job, how is God going to trust you to work for him? Amen. How long before? Is anybody in here that's married and has been married for more than five years? Anybody? I have. It's just it's all lovey-dovey, honey, sweet, and everything. But it don't stay like that forever. Amen. Now, I know a pastor that says, well, in my marriage, the honey never came off the moon. I never believed that. He complained too much about his wife to tell, to, for that to work. He talked about his wife bad. But the honey never came off the moon. No, there, you, when you can't be diligent at home, your wife is on your nerves, but you still do the right thing. 
Hallelujah. I ain't looking at nobody. <laughs> I'm talking to you, Lord. <laughs> if you can't treat your wife good when there's bumps in the road, when she's trying to provoke you into an argument, when, when she's saying stuff that you know she knows you don't like it, but she's going to say it anyway. And you can't control yourself. How are you going to control yourself with God's people? You're not even as close to them as you are your wife. And if you can't treat your wife well, how are you going to treat God's people well? That's the reason why he said you got to be uh, the husband of one wife. It's important for you to have that kind of relationship. You're lacking in how to deal with God's people if you don't know how to deal with a wife. And sisters, it's the other way around too. If it's a woman that's a pastor and you don't know how to treat your husband at home and you constantly trying to provoke him into fighting, you can't be a good pastor. Now I know, I know that I know preachers right now that, you know, well, a woman can't be qualified to be a pastor because it uh, must be the husband of one wife. Amen. I'm not, I'm not going to go up that road. I'll leave it alone. <laughs> yeah, we ain't going to get, yeah, right. We ain't going to get that started. <laughs> if a man does not know how to be faithful in his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? If a man doesn't know how to be diligent in his own home, how can he be faithful over God's house? Do you see where he's going with that? If you can't treat something good that's close to you, how are you going to be able to be over God's people? You can't be. So a ruler, being a ruler in God's house is a gift from God. Not everybody can do it. Some people are so wrapped up in their feelings they can't ever get beyond it. There are some people that are going to go to hell because they can't get past their feelings. Amen. Amen. Every time I lay my eyes on him, every time I see her car drive by, how is that a way to be talking and you say, right. Amen. they make me so sick my stomach hurts. I want to slap them every time I see them. I had somebody tell me that one time. Every time I look at them, I want to choke them. You can't be saved like that. You can't be filled with the Holy Ghost and love Jesus but ready to choke somebody just because you, every time I see him, I want to choke him. Not a novice. Move on, let me move on. Not a novice. Lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into condemnation of the devil. You can't be a pastor and you're a rookie in the ministry. Because let me tell you what people will do to you. You come in one Sunday to preach, and they're laying palm leaves down, yelling, Hosanna in the highest. <laughs> Get up and preach something they don't like, and when you're walking out the door, they be yelling, crucifying. That's the way people are. And if you're not careful, you'll fall for the hype. And I'm not saying this to be ugly. I just want you to understand um, how, how you have to be when, you, when you're a pastor. People come up, oh, that message was so good. I don't pay no attention to that. It's not, for, there's many reasons, but, but let me just say it this way. That's the best message you ever preached. Now, what do you think I'm going to do next Sunday? I'm going to be trying to keep up with or outdo the last message I did. If you get that kind of mindset, right. you are no longer preaching to the people. Right. You are preaching for the praise. Amen. That's a common problem that a novice will fall into. I don't care how good I am. I'm not going to wear that around like it's a badge. Right. That's, that's the wrong approach. Right. Right. Somebody told me one time, that was a really good message. I said, just wait till next week. 
Yes, sir. Do I think it, his, his question is, do I think that um, humility is the first character that someone should have if they're going to be a pastor? I don't know that it's the first, but you need to have humility. Amen. And let me just say this. If you don't have it, the people will give it to you. They will. Sure as you thinking you doing something good, somebody going to come along. Let me tell you what so-and-so said about you, Pastor. People will do that. Right. Now, they feel like maybe, maybe they feel like they're trying to help you. Or maybe they feel like that they're being your ally by snitching on somebody. But it doesn't matter. The bottom line is... They can come in and say, I just want you to know I love you, but so-and-so said they can't stand your messages. That, now, that doesn't make me love you more. Right, right, exactly. It just makes me more uncomfortable the next time I'm up preaching and I see you sitting out there. Yeah. Yeah. That's all that does. Yes, ma'am. Her question is, what about single pastors? Well, I think it, it would matter if they're a single pastor and started off single and he never been married. Um, you can't be a good pastor if you've never been married. You just can't. Now, I'm not saying that it's undoable, that it's impossible. I, I don't speak to that. I just know one of the qualifications is the husband of one wife. I don't know that that's a requirement. Wait, hold on. Let, let me not say it that way. I don't know if the requirement is if you're going to be married, only have one wife. Remember, the Apostle Paul, he was not married. He was not married, but he had been. So I think, I think scripturally speaking, it is a necessity for someone to be a pastor, if they're going to be a pastor, to, to have at least been married successfully. Now, if your marriage falls apart because you can't get yourself together, your wife finally goes off and leaves you and divorces you because you just wouldn't live right. You, would, you was acting nasty, coming in two, three days, missing in action and all that kind of stuff. And then finally gets grounds to divorce you because you cheated on her. And then she divorces you, but you get yourself together. And now you want to be a pastor. No, I, I think you're disqualified. I'll leave that up to those who are laying hands on the presbyter. Right. I'll leave that up to them. But I would never, never install someone to be a pastor that has not been successful in marriage. And being successful in marriage does not mean that it's always, every time y'all at home, you're just sitting and smiling at each other. <laughs> what you thinking? Really, I was thinking the same. It's not like that. You have to manage it. You have to know how to manage difficulties, manage conflicts, because there will be conflicts in a marriage. And if you can't learn how to manage that, how will you manage conflicts in the church? Yes, ma'am. Her question is, when it says not a novice, would that be someone that's like a new convert? That's exactly what it is. Somebody that's not, that hasn't been saved long. Now, how long did the apostles, all of them, including Paul, how long did they train under Jesus? At least three years. All of them, including Paul. Three years with Jesus being taught. But you get the Holy Ghost and six months later you pastoring. That doesn't even make sense. But there's some that do it, especially when famous people get come to church. First thing they want to do after they've been walking with Christ for a year, I've decided I'm going to step out and be a pastor. Yes, sir. Scripturally. His question is, so then scripturally, you have to be married to be a pastor. Well, what if my wife died today? No, I mean, he said, at, no, at the beginning. I'm saying scripturally, this is the qualifications that God has laid out. Scripturally. I wouldn't want to sit under someone. I, 
The reason why I'm saying that is because there are times when God will make an exception to a rule to get done what he wants done. And I can't speak to that. I'm just saying here, the qualifications of a pastor in the Bible is this. But these aren't the only qualifications either. Look at verse number uh, seven. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. You can't have the people loving you up, but folks in the streets hating you, and you'll be an effective pastor. You can't do that. You have to, how do you have a good report? When people are trying to provoke you out in the streets, how do you have a good report? By following peace. And seeking after it, pursuing peace. That's how you get a good report. I deal with people all the time that don't have the Holy Ghost, that don't come to church. But I have a good report with them because I listen, I keep the conversation in a not bad way, we ain't sitting around telling dirty jokes and winking at girls and all like, not like that. It's how you conduct yourself. You can carry yourself in such a way that people don't feel comfortable being nasty around you. You can do that. But it's all on you. And if you're going to be a pastor, you should know how to talk to sinners as well as saints and make sure that every, there, I, there have been times I've been in restaurants Got terrible service. And I didn't, I, where's your manager? I didn't do all of that. Right. I want, I'm not looking to stir up nothing. Amen. You have to train yourself to be like that. Uh-uh. This, uh, oh, no, no, no. This, this, my food is cold. Get, get somebody, and then, uh, <clears throat> y'all going to count me? How, what kind of reputation are you building? Amen. Right. I've been in places where they really legitimately messed up someone's meal and tried to comp mine. I told them, no, I'm paying for mine. Oh, no, no, the manager said you can have it on the house. I said, I don't want it on the house. Let me talk to the manager. When the manager come out, I said, listen, my meal was good. My service was good. I want to pay for my meal and give a tip. What they do and what you do for them, that's on you and them. But it ain't got nothing to do with my meal. Mine was good. He thanked me and I paid for my, my food. Now, I could have gotten ugly. You know what? The whole Y'all just ruined my whole day out. People do that kind of stuff because they want something for free. Pastors shouldn't be involved in that kind of stuff. We should be understanding we mess up people's lives without even realizing it. L let me say it like this. Servers, servers get paid two, three dollars an hour and live off of tips. And we'll go in, the food was a little cold. I'm not tipping. What did the server have to do with it? They brought it out from the kitchen to your, but we mad at them. Somebody, I, I just won't give a tip. It's not, we, we, we are impacting people's lives. So I don't get carried away. I don't get all nasty and indignant. My, if I can just tell you this real quick. My granddaughter just had her vehicle break down. I called AAA. They said they would be there in 90 minutes, within 90 minutes. We sat at her house for two hours. Finally, I said, just take me home, and when they get here, here, take my, my ID. When they get here, show it to them, and then bring me my driver's license back when, when it's all done. I forgot all about it. The next day, I look at my, my I call her. I said, did they come? She said, no, they never even showed up. I said, oh, okay. So I look at my app, and it said they was 892 minutes past due. I called them up. I said, you know, yesterday I, I scheduled an, uh, a tow. It never came. Is there, what, what, is there a problem? Well, huh, they must not have put it in the system right. Let me set it up for you right now. 
I said, okay. So they did. Never showed up that day. The third day comes around. I said, we've been waiting. What's going on? I mean, can we get this thing scheduled? What do, what, what, do I, what do I need to do? And she explained it and apologized and all that. We'll be there in 90 minutes. An hour and 10 minutes later, I get a phone call, an automated call saying, well, we're, we're working diligently to get your ticket resolved. Hung up the phone. A minute later, I get another phone call. We're on our way. We found somebody. Then I waited another hour for him to show up. Now, I didn't get nasty with the people that I, that I called. I didn't get ugly with the tow truck driver. None of that. Now, they, whatever it was that they were, had going on, somebody wasn't doing their job like they were supposed to. And one of the, one of the employees told me, she said, well, they're supposed to put you on hold and call and verify that they've got a ticket opened up for you and verify how long it's going to be before they can get there. She didn't do that. I said, no. The next day when I called, I said, ma'am, they told me that you should put me on hold and verify. She said, okay, I'll do that. And when she did, it, my phone said, boop, boop, boop. <laughs> Had to turn around and call them right back again. They act like they didn't know who I was or what was going on. I had to start the whole process all over again. I, I didn't get all riled up and uh, uh, I pay good money for this. I, I didn't do all of that. Now, it's, that was just one event, okay? But if I'm in the habit of treating people ugly on the phone, if I'm in the habit of treating people ugly in restaurants, I'm going to treat them ugly everywhere. Because I have learned, I've gotten into the habit of doing that. A pastor can't be like that. Amen. You can't be just snapping and popping off on people because they vexed you. Amen. You can't do that. Amen. Hallelujah. Yes. But that's not all. Deacons. Let me just read something real quick. 1 Peter 5 and 1, verses 1 through 6. The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock. Now, who's he talking to? The pastors. Feed the flock which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly. Not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. How do you take it over? You take the oversight that God has given you, but you don't do it by constraint. You don't just badmouth and bully and force God's people to do what you want. Now, he's going to be a little more clear about this in just a moment, but he said it's one thing. If you're a pastor, take the oversight. That means... Take responsibility for what's going on. It's like, well, the, 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 the people are leaving trash in the back of the church. Well, that ain't my job. Go talk to the ushers. Yeah. That's not taking the oversight. Amen. Neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. What does he mean by being a lord over God's heritage? Well, Minister Wicker just went and bought a new car. Yeah. Man, you didn't say nothing to me about that. You need to take that car back. I think you, with you having a family, this is the kind of car you need to have. So take that back and go get you a minivan. That's being a lord over God's heritage. I can't tell you how many times saints will text me or call me and ask, is it okay if I do this? I'm like, oh, you're grown. I'm not guiding your life like that. You're grown. You're an adult. You figure out what you want to do. If you want my opinion or some advice, I'll give you that. But I'm not telling you what to do because that's being a lord over God's heritage. It's not my responsibility as a pastor to tell people how to live their lives. You want to put premium fuel in your car, knock yourself out. 
You want a TV in every room of your house. That's your business. It's not, I have nothing to do with that. And I shouldn't. As a pastor, it's not my job to do that. That's going beyond what God has asked for. Not by a constraint, but willingly. A pastor has to be willing to do. So people will call me, I need some advice. And if, I'm sorry that I've called you. That, that, that don't bother me. I'm willing. I'm willing to help. I'm, I'm willing to do. So it's not a matter of you a burden to me because you're calling me to ask me something. That's, that's not it at all. Uh, verse 5, likewise ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you submit, be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. Now, I, I'm going to stop there. We, won't, we don't need to read verse 6. I just wanted to say this. What you expect from your pastor is what you should be doing. He said, by being an example, an example, you should be, the pastor should be the example of how you should live, how you should behave. Somebody make you upset, you can pop off on them. I, I, I had, we were somewhere and somebody said something really rude and nasty to me. And my granddaughter said, did you hear what they said to you? I said, yeah. I didn't respond to it. That's being an example. But for me to, to say nasty things to God's people and then turn around and expect you to give me respect, no. No. Got to be an example. But it's the other way around, too. You can't expect the pastor to be nice to you, but you're always being nasty to him Amen. or her. He can't be like that. So that's the reason why he said, likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Do what they say. It's one thing if a pastor is being unreasonable and just crazy and out of order. It's what well, that's different. If he's being a lord over God's heritage, then he's wrong too. Amen. In First Timothy three and eight, likewise must a deacon be grave, not double tongued not given to much wine, not greedy of filthy lucre. And let me just say this, as far as the wine is concerned. He, this is not, um, a, it's a okay to drink wine. They had problems with their water. Wine was being used to get their stomach under control. A deacon should be able to withstand a little bit and still be right. You don't, you, so he, they, were, they were saying, yes, you may be having trouble. Take a little wine for your stomach. But this was not saying, well, a deacon, you can be a deacon, but just don't be getting drunk all the time. That's, it wasn't like that. You, know, you see that a lot in the churches today. Amen. Pastors, too, getting drunk, partying, having a good time. Might as well enjoy it now. But a deacon must be grave, not double-tongued. A, a deacon shouldn't be up in the pastor's face grinning, talking about, is there anything else I can do to help? And then get with the saints talking about, did you hear what he said? That's double-tongued. I'm all saved when I come to church, but catch me out in the street, and you're liable to catch anything coming out of my mouth. You can't be like that. Leadership was so important that God was very specific in how he expected, what he expected. Not given to wine, nor striker. Not greedy for filthy lucre. Oh, wait a minute. I'm back up into the pastor. Not greedy for filthy Verse 9. Holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. And let these also first be proved. Then let them use the office of a deacon, being found blameless 
They have to be proven first. So somebody come in and get the Holy Ghost. Six months later, you know what? You're really good at paying tithes and offering and are you faithful and everything. I'm going to make you a deacon. That's not, they haven't been proven yet. Right. Six months, a year, two years, that's not, that's not long enough to be proven. No. Folks walk away from God much quicker than that. Yeah. And some of them hang around for a little while and then they go. Yeah. You should know them. A pastor should know them that labor among God's people. Yeah. Let these... Also first be proved. Then, after you have been faithful, after you have been diligent in doing what you're doing, after, if you go verse 11, even so must their wives be grave, not slanderers, sober, faithful in all things. If it's that important, then the deacon's wife should be faithful too. Now, how are you going to make somebody a deacon or a deaconess and their marriage is a train wreck? You're not qualified. It's not me saying it. The Bible says it. You're not qualified. Well, I just need something to help me because my husband just won't do right. And I just need something in the church. Can I be a deaconess? No, your house is tore up. You cannot. The Bible says no. Faithful sometimes. And that's not the deacon. That's the deacon's wife. Faithful in all things. If she says she's going to do something, she should be doing it. It don't make sense, though, when the deacon says, I'm going to do something, and wife says, no, you're not. I've already got other plans. You ain't doing it. Okay. No. No. That's out of order. All right, let me just go on. Let the deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children and their own houses well. Same qualifications as a pastor. People act like being a deacon means you just collect money. Far more responsibility than that. God would not lay all of these restrictions and rules and qualifications down for a deacon if all his job is collecting money. Amen. It's not like that. Why should he be faithful? Because God's house needs things. Amen. For they that you have used the office of a deacon well, purchased to themselves a good degree and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. So if you, if you desire the gift of being a ruler, then you have to be diligent and faithful, not just at church. I'm faithful I'm faithful to every service. I'm faithful to everything the pastor asks of me. Go to my house and your wife is walking to the grocery store because you refuse to fix her car or let her use yours. You understand what I'm saying? You can't be faithful to church, but your life outside the church is so raggedy that people are looking at you crazy. Every now and then they see the deacon staggering down the street. Praise the Lord, Deacon. <laughs> it can't be like that. You know why it is? Because somebody made someone a deacon that was not qualified to be a deacon. Amen. I thought I was going to be finished tonight. I've got six more scriptures. I'm just teasing. I'm teasing. <laughs> Diligence. Diligence doesn't just start in the church. Diligence is in all aspects of your life. You have to be diligent at home. You have to be diligent at work. You have to be diligent in church. 
before God is willing to use you because you can't be off balanced because eventually it'll tell on you. I'm going to say something real quick. Um, and I'm not trying to put him on the spot. Um, it's with Deacon Scott. Don't y'all look at him funny. <laughs> Get your laugh out now. No. <laughs> when I first came here, we grew up together. We've been friends. We grew up together. I said, he said, now I'll call you David uh, when we're not in church, but when we're around the saints, I'll call you pastor. I said, that's a bad idea. Because once you get in the habit of doing it somewhere else, you'll slip and you'll forget. I said, and I don't care about titles, but people do. And if they hear you calling me by my first name, they're going to be mad at you. So I wouldn't do that. Oh, I'm not going to slip. I'm not going to slip. One day we was here in the church doing something. Saints is all milling around stuff. And he said, David. Oh. I said, I told you. Sure enough, somebody come up to me. I don't like that. What's he calling you by your first name for and you the pastor? I said, that. I said, don't be like that. Don't be like that. If you're going to be a pastor, you got to deal with all kind of stuff. Good or bad, indifferent, it doesn't matter. But here's my point. You can't be faithful in one area, not faithful in another area, and think that it won't bleed over or slip into another area. If you can't be faithful in all areas, then God can't use you. Yes, ma'am. Um, her question is, is the reason why it doesn't list in the requirement about having the Holy Ghost because he's speaking to the church. Give me just a moment. Are we okay? Don't be mad at me. Oh, he said, I'll get you later. Y'all pray for him. <laughs> yes, he was not writing to the world. He was writing to the church. Yes. Her question is, is the reason why deacons are usually male because of the type of work they do around the church? No, there's deacons and deaconesses, and deaconesses in the Bible. So even though he's giving the qualifications here and using the masculine, it doesn't matter. It applies for the feminine also. And then there's another scripture, even for the, the wife that is a pastor, there's stipulations about the fact that even when she gets home, she still is to be subject to her husband. So she may take the oversight at the church, but if she's got a home, she needs to know how to run that right too. And a wife, the Bible says, every wise woman buildeth up her home, but the foolish plucketh it down with her hands. So there is a um, amount of responsibility for a wife also in making her home run smoothly. If she knows that her husband doesn't like something, but she's doing it and don't care. Well, that's a problem. But my, my wife, <laughs> my wife, oh, I love my wife. <laughs> she used to aggravate me all the time, moving furniture around. Twice a month, I'd come home and it didn't even look like the same house. She was always moving furniture. But I didn't care. It wasn't one of those things where I was like, don't move this furniture no more. I, all I would tell her is, if I was blind, I would be bleeding all the time because you always move and stuff. There's a way for a husband to be diligent and faithful in his home and for a wife to be diligent and faithful in the home. And it's not a conflict because they're both serving each other. So if you are a female pastor, the same restrictions, the same rules go for you too. He just, did, he just gave it in the male gender, but there was female pastors in the Bible. The Bible talks about it. I think it was Dorcas, Phoebe. 
The elect lady, yeah, she was a pastor. Yeah. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. His question is, um, the husband of one wife, what if a person is saved, they get married, then his wife dies? Does that disqualify him from being a pastor? Any, the, I, I'll go back to this. You should have experience in being a husband or a wife successfully. Now, if you mean to your wife, you're going to be mean to God's people. If you let your wife do whatever she feels like doing and don't ever say nothing, then you're going to be like that with God's people. There should be governance. There should be some kind of communication between the husband and wife. There should be some type of leadership structure in the home. I don't fool with the money. I'm no good with that. But my wife, there's certain things. I, she can ask all she wants. No, 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 we're not doing that. But I'm fair. We talk about it. And then once we come up with it, now she'll change, but I'm not going to. You want to make sure that the cars are parked in the garage? Yes. Well, then after we've discussed it and I say, yeah, we'll park them in the garage. then she's like, you know what? I don't want it parked in the garage. I'm too bad. We've already talked about it. It goes back in the garage. That's not being mean. That's not being a dictator. We've discussed it. This is what we come up with. And women change a lot. Go outside and make sure there's no stones out there, would you? <laughs> women change a lot. And yeah, they do. I mean, that's just the reality of it. I'm not trying to be nasty, but women do change a lot. They're built different than we are. They think different than we do. But a husband should be steady. He should be. And not mean about it. Just steady. All right, wake up my dismisser. All right. Let us stand.